I would like to welcome uh, Carl Ehrlich, who is our uh, U.S. State Department Educational and Cultural Affairs uh, Annual Professor, who will get us started with our introductions. Carl. Among the impromptu social activities that take place among us fellows at the Albright Institute is trying to solve the daily New York Times crossword puzzle in a communal manner. Many of the puzzle's clues are framed as puns or plays on words, i.e. as paranomasias. In this spirit, allow me to introduce today's workshop organizer paranomastically as my fellow fellow who is not a fellow. <laughs> Nadia Knudsen is an archeological illustrator with over 30 years experience and countless illustrations in myriad publications. She received her honors BA in general archeology span from University College of London or UCL at which institution she subsequently took an archeological draftsmanship course which launched her illustrious career as an illustrator. A dozen years ago, Nadia returned to UCL to continue her studies of archeology, span specializing in Eastern Mediterranean and Middle Eastern archeology. span She was awarded an MA with distinction on the basis of her dissertation entitled, Figuratively Speaking, a study of aspects of the life history of some terracotta figurines from Tel Beit Yerach. Nadia is currently working on her PhD from Tel Aviv University under the supervision of Professor Raphael or Rafi Greenberg. Her research specialization in the study of figurines is reflected in the title of her dissertation in progress on early Bronze Age zoomorphic figurines in the Southern Levant, form, technology, and significance and in the titles of a handful of publications that are either in press or have already seen the light of day. In addition to her work as an archeological researcher and illustrator, Nadia has gained substantial field experience as a staff member at archeological sites in Israel, Jordan, and Kurdistan, among which one way mention Tel Yakush, Khirbet Um al and Shari Zor, respectively. She has been an associate fellow of the Albright Institute for over half a dozen years and currently holds the Carol and Eric Myers doctoral dissertation and Filkins Family Research Fellowship. The theme of Nadia's workshop today is shared methodologies, the importance of technological, temporal, and social aspects of figurine research for which she will be joined by our guest speaker, Monique Arntz, who Nadia will introduce in more detail presently. When I asked Nadia how to introduce her today, she modest, modestly said, do it in three words. So your wish is my command. Here is Nadia. <laughs> and thank you all of you for coming out this very beautiful afternoon. I would like to uh, also thank the Albright Institute and the Carol and Eric Myers doctoral dissertation in Filkins Family Research Fellowship for supporting my research and for hosting this mini workshop. I'm also indebted to all of those who've supported my many visits to, to their institutions, the generosity of the staff at the IAA, Israel and uh, Rockefeller Museums and the excavation direct, directors amongst others who have given me endless access to their amazing animal figurines. Thank you, especially to Michael Johnson and Matt and Aaron for setting up all this technical stuff for this, for this event. And also, not least, many thanks to Hisham, the chef, for the splendid spread that he's prepared for all of us, a positive sign of the gradual return for even greater levels of normality. Now, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Monique Arts, this afternoon. The title of the presentation is Figurines as Socially Embedded Technology, the importance of accounting for social and temporal aspects of figurine research, a case study from Chatal Huyak in Turkey and Tel Sabiyabiyad in Syria. Monique received both her first degrees from Leiden University. Her BA was in general archaeology and her MA dissertation is on the, is on the research, research master's track 
called Town and Country, Mediterranean and Near Eastern Archaeology, culminating in her dissertation entitled Shifting Focus Towards an Understanding of Figurine Production, Use and, and Deposition, a case study from the late Neolithic Tel Aviad in Syria, and was supervised by Professor Peter Ackermans. Very recently, Monique submitted her PhD thesis from Cambridge University, which she completed under the supervision of Professor Augusta McMahon and with John Robb as advisor. The title is Beyond Meaning, an Artifact Approach to the Neolithic Figurines from Tel Aviad in Syria and Chateau Hoyer. Monique's experience in the field includes includes and has a long-term connection with the Jebel Koma project in Jordan. And she has spent two seasons in Chatal Hoya in Turkey, gathering data for her PhD thesis. And she has also participated on a survey project in Oman. So through the magic of Zoom and the wizardry of other technical things, I'm delighted that she's here and to take part in this workshop. Honey, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Nadia. I'm very happy to be with you uh, in the virtual world, unfortunately not in the real world, but maybe somewhere in the future. So what I wanna focus on today is just um, two aspects of my PhD research, um, two aspects that I think are too often overlooked, uh, and that is the aspect of time in our analysis and indeed the importance of understanding social settings if you want to understand figurine practices. Um, as Nadja told me, not all of you are necessarily experts on the Neolithic or figurines. So I'm gonna start by giving a very brief overview um, of figurines uh, throughout this period in the Near East. And then of course, because I wanna emphasize the importance of social context uh, we have to spend some time on um, talking about the social settings at both sites. Uh, then briefly, um, the materials and methods that I employed uh, in my PhD. And I will then focus on just a few examples of interesting results that I gleaned um, by incorporating social context and time into my research. Um, and of course, always the obligatory concluding remarks. So, um, and again, this is of course very brief. It's hard to describe, um, um, you know, uh, over 8,000 years, 7,000 years in a couple of slides, but um, figurines have a very long history in the ancient Near East, already in the epi Paleolithic or Natuvian. Uh, figurines are very rare. Um, most often we see zoomorphic motifs incorporated in objects such as stone bowls and uh, pestles. Uh, but we do have some figurines uh, in this period, mostly carved out of soft uh, limestones. In the following uh, pre-pottery Neolithic A, figurines become um, a bit more common. We find them um, still often in stone, but now also some uh, clay figurines um, begin to um, appear at some sites. Some of the earliest are actually from Murebet in Syria, shown here on the left. Um, there are some regional differences in materials used and um, the types of figurines we find. So um, anthropomorphic, mostly Southern Levant, Northern Mesopotamia, also some more animal figurines. In the following pre Neolithic B, figurine uh, numbers uh, increase substantially. But of course, we have to remember also that we have many more excavated sites from this period and also larger excavated areas. Um, so there is a bit of a uh, excavation bias there, uh, but we do um, in this period um, start uh, to have large um, assemblages from sites. To, so it does seem that per ratio figurines um, are more commonly uh, made uh, at many sites. Uh, there is a whole range of animal and uh, human shapes that we find, um, often quite um, sort of abstract, as you can see um, in this picture. But um, the focus has uh, been uh, in past research mostly on the so-called um, seated female figurines. Uh, and here I've shown some uh, examples. And these sort of focus on very fleshy human shapes, um, often uh, perceived to be female. And uh, a few uh, or quite a few actually do have these sort of you know, big buttocks and breasts. 
Um, and these figurines um, in the past have been identified as being uh, mother goddesses. Um, and indeed, uh, Chatahuk is one of the type sites uh, for, for this type of figurine. Um, but they uh, are actually quite rare, but because so much focus has been paid uh, to these figurines, it appears that, that you know, they are very common. And this sort of homogeneous picture of what figurines look like and subsequently what they mean has uh, developed. And that unfortunately still hampers uh, figurine studies today. Then in the Pottery Neolithic, um, again, some regional differences. Uh, some uh, areas have more stone figurines, uh, but still clay is very, uh, very common. Throughout the uh, Pottery Neolithic, we see that figurines tend to become a bit more detailed. So more attention is paid to facial features, depicting clothing, uh, necklaces, uh, hairstyles, and the like. And also they become more complex in their production. So um, towards the end of the Pottery Neolithic, they are uh, much more common, um, commonly baked, uh, baked as ceramics are baked. Uh, and they have slip layers, they have paints, and uh, at times even uh, bitumen is used uh, to um, accentuate uh, eyes uh, and hair and the like. So this is a very brief overview, but what I hope that you will take away from it is that there is a lot of um, variety on both an inter and intrasite level. And this has been obs um, obscured largely by past research. And we don't really understand why some sites have figurines and others have not. Um, and that's why we need to understand social context as well to maybe under explain why uh, some sites have figurines and others don't. So turning now to my two case study sites, um, Chatahuk um, in the central plain in Anatolia, uh, Tel Sebi Abiyad in modern day um, Syria, uh, in the past called Northern, northern uh, Mesopotamia. Um, Tel Sebi Abiyad is located about 80 kilometers from the Syrian Turkish border. Um, there is actually also um, a mountain range that separates them. So this picture is a bit um, deceptive. Um, both are very long lived sites uh, inhabited roughly um, during the same period, um, spanning um, a very long period, as you can see. Uh, they're both well excavated uh, by uh, Mallard uh, and later Ian Hodder at Chatehuk and uh, Professor Peter Ackermans, uh, who excavated uh, Tel Sibi Abiyad. Of course, if you want to compare two sites, it, it's important to have some sort of a baseline um, of comparison. Um, so that's important. Um, as you can see here, um, we see Tel Sabi Abiyad actually comprised of four mounds. Uh, the most extensively excavated is uh, Tel Sabi Abiyad 1, which you can see in the upper right corner uh, in various operations. Uh, Tel Sabi Abiyad 3 and 2 have also been excavated. They are dated um, earlier. Uh, with um, probably more PPMB uh, occupation that has not been um, um, excavated. Um, and Tel Sibi Abiyad 4 is currently um, um, a graveyard, um, so no research has been done there. Um, Chatehuk also comprises two mounds. Um, the West Mound uh, is not been extensively excavated. Uh, focus has, has always been on uh, the larger East Mound excavated by both Mallard uh, and Hodder. Now this baseline of uh, comparison, so both sites, uh, like I said, uh, roughly contempor contemporaneous, um, similar um, subsistence patterns. So a focus, early focus on domesticates uh, with some elements of hunting wild uh, taxa and uh, gathering some wild plants. Both sites um, have a very early introduction of pottery, actually some of the earliest, if not the earliest pottery in Anatolia and Northern Mesopotamia respectively. Um, throughout all the levels, the earliest levels to the latest, we have figurines, um, also more geometric clay objects uh, commonly designated as tokens. Both sites also evidence uh, long distance trade in stone uh, sources. Uh, because there is no stone present uh, in the vicinity of both sites, most notably um, obsidian uh, that comes uh, from Cappadocia, um, and also another uh, larger range of stone bowls, stone beads, 
and also um, some stone figurines, uh, most notably at Satehuk. Uh, there are more than uh, we have found at Tel Sabi Abayat. But of course, if you want to um, look at different social settings, um, or if you want to look at social settings and how they influence uh, figurine practices, it's, all, it's of course interesting to have different social settings. And indeed, the, the sites are similar in some ways, but also very different in other ways. Most notably, um, Chatehuk seems to be the cul culmination of a long um, development in the Konya Plain. And um, Chatehuk is then this mega site, as it was imagined in the past, really densely packed houses. Um, and in the past, um, population numbers have been postulated to be anywhere from three to 8,000 people. Now, through more recent um, um, studies and continuous focus on refining carbon dates, these numbers have been adjusted um, to be um, much lower, but still they were still much higher than they ever were at Tel Sabi Abiyad. Um, Peter Ackermans coined the term shifting settlements to describe um, the site of Tel Sabi Abiyad. And indeed, between the different mounds and on the main mound, settlement was moving around continuously, at times um, very short intervals. Um, people were living in a certain spot for maybe one generation and then the settlement moved. So over time, this created the illusion of a very large uh, site. And of course, the main cell is substantial, but um, there was never any more than a couple of dozen to maybe a hundred people maximum living at the site at any given time. Um, it's also um, important, um, this idea of not really a continuity of place, uh, which is in contrast to Chatehuk, where Ian Hoddard uh, coined uh, the term history house. Now, all houses to some extent have internal um, elaboration, as we can see here in these pictures, but some did have more than others. And some houses have uh, very long um, chronologies and they are, you know, they were rebuilt on sort of the same footprint time and time again. We see um, continuous replastering of the walls um, and the floors and also very complex uh, burial rit uh, um, uh, rituals. And uh, some houses contain many more uh, burials than others. And for these houses, um, Ian Hodder coined the term history house. Now, this is in contrast to Tel Sabi Abiyad, um, where there's no really a continuation um, of a building chronologies or sort of a very standardized way of, of building houses. Uh, furthermore, um, Tel Sabi Abiyad has uh, two uh, uh, very large communal cemeteries that have been found thus far, used for many generations. Um, the houses at Chatehuk all have their own um, facilities for processing, storing, and preparing food. Whilst um, at Tel Sabi Abiyad, we see that these activities take place mostly in the large open areas between different buildings. Um, and another uh, very interesting, if not the interesting uh, find from Tel Sabi Abiyad is the very early evidence for the communal storage um, of goods and of sealing uh, goods, um, which I will show in the next slide. But we can postulate that at uh, Chatehu, the focus was more on the household, whilst at Tel Sabi Abiyad, it was more on the community as a whole. And of course, this was also likely because um, population numbers um, at Tel Sabi Abiyad were, were, were such that everybody likely knew each other and had daily interactions, whilst Chatehuk was perhaps more anonymous in that sense because of the larger population numbers and people identified more um, with the household or the houses in their uh, immediate um, vicinity. Returning to these uh, ceiling practices, um, the so-called um, burnt uh, village uh, dating to around uh, 62 to 2000 uh, BC um, has these very large buildings that you can see um, highlighted in yellow, uh, these very sort of standardized uh, cubicle uh, rooms that had evidence for um, the um, bulk storage of grains. Um, and also in these other rooms, there were um, a whole plethora of finds uh, that seemed to have some sort of an economic um, or um, administrative um, function, including many ceilings, as you can see um, on the top right. 
So people uh, had uh, containers and there was, um, you know, could be stone vessels, uh, clay vessels, uh, baskets and the like. They were covered um, by clay, sometimes with like string around it. And then they were impressed with these personal seals. So marking personal property. Um, and also uh, many figurines were found uh, in these rooms. It's not necessarily um, primary deposit per se, but it's sort of like a curated assemblage that was put into these rooms. And um, subsequently, um, this whole settlement of large part of the settlement uh, was um, burnt um, um, intentionally. Uh, there was also uh, two um, uh, burials um, associated with this burning of the, of the settlement. And this is some of the earliest ev evidence that we have um, in, the, in the Neolithic for seals um, and tokens as uh, items of um, um, sort of economic um, activities. It was not the case that there was sort of like um, um, elements of um, some sort of an elite being able to, um, to have their own personal goods. There are many uh, different ceilings uh, found so it seems that every individual or at least every household uh, had their own seal. At first it was um, interpreted as being uh, related to a larger regional trade network, uh, but later um, interpretation changed to that of um, a permanent part of um, uh, the population that lived at the site year round versus uh, people that were herding uh, the flocks of sheep and goat further afield um, who came to the site um, uh, you know, at some point in the year. Uh, and when they were away, they, had the, um, they could store and uh, seal their uh, personal property. And this is in contrast to uh, Chatehuk. Um, tokens have been found, um, but there's no uh, real evidence that they were used for any sort of accounting um, uh, purposes. Another very interesting thing to observe is both sites have uh, really marked changes in the later levels, which um, has been linked to the 8.2 Ka event, a sort of period of um, climatic change. Um, sediment declines <clears throat> at both sites. There seems to be sort of some sort of a breakdown of this um, history house system. <clears throat> there's no more underfloor burials. There's no more actual presence of Augoch Ukraine, um, but now instead we see plastered elements and we see 3D elements of uh, animal horns on the pottery. At Atzalsabi Abiyad, uh, we see um, round buildings appear, um, as we saw also on the map uh, of the of the Burn village, which also dates around this time, of course. Um, there's a market changes in um, subsistence, hunting declines at both sites. Um, and at both sites, this is a time where we sort of see this sort of element of um, pastoralism uh, appearing. Uh, Chatehuk seems to have smaller flocks, <clears throat> heard it more on the household level and also farther, farther afield. <clears throat> it's also be obvious that um, there is um, um, convincing evidence for what's been called sort of the secondary product revolution. So lipids on pottery evidence the use of milk. Um, and there's a, a very steep um, incline uh, or an increase and the amount of spindle whorls found at the site. So fiber processing uh, seems to become uh, more important. And these changes have been interpreted um, on sort of a larger scale as occurring in, in the Northern Mesopotamian Anatolia um, as sort of the painted pottery revolution. We see changes in subsistence settlements, um, evidence for feasting at many sites in this region. Um, and also um, many sites now have this beautifully painted pottery, including uh, Chatahuk and Tel Sabi Abayat. And this is, has been explained by either uh, the movement um, of people um, and also perhaps increased networking between people at these different sites. Now, this is my uh, data set. <clears throat> I um, researched the entire uh, corpora of, these bo of both of these sites. So I didn't focus on any type of figurine. I wanted to uh, look at all the figurines, including also the fragmentary objects. Um, both sites have um, both zoomorphic and anthropomorphic figurines. At Tel Sabi Abiyat, there are never any real realistic, uh, albeit exaggerated human shapes. So there's not really um, a difference. So that's why I uh, grouped them together. 
Um, and all in all, I have uh, you know over 4,000 figurines, which is uh, an amazing data set to work with. I could show you uh, probably 50 slides with uh, figurines, um, and then you would still not uh, you know, have a, a real good idea of the sense of the, the range of, uh, of objects. But uh, uh, some of them are shown here. So on the left, uh, Chata Hug, and on the right, Telsobi Abiyat. And um, so we have the more um, abbreviated shapes on top than the more um, uh, you know, realistic, albeit exaggerated human shapes. Um, number 10 and 11 uh, are actually stone figurines uh, found uh, during the hotter excavations. And you see a range of, um, of animal figurines and at Chateauhuk, there are more that are actually recognizable as being any particular animal instead of just um, a generic uh, four-legged critter. Um, so, you know, we, we have goats, we have sheep, we have bovine, we have pig. Um, um, yeah, and these sort of uh, creatures with long tails have been interpreted as either being fox or maybe a reptilian. And then um, on the lower uh, rank um, line, uh, for example, number 17 and 18, uh, these are figurines modeled just as animal heads. So uh, without um, um, a body attached. And of course, uh, we also have a whole range of, um, um, of fragments that are not clearly um, identifiable. Um, they, are, they are part of figurines, that much I can say, but what type of figurine, I can't really say. So those are the um, categories of indeterminate and unclear, but I still um, you know, took them into consideration in my analysis. So what I did was basically reconstruct the life biographies of uh, figurines, starting of course with a sort of their, their chaîne apparatoire or their production, focusing on those um, sort of choices that people had when they made figurines that I could actually make some sort of a sensible statement on um, based on visual inspection of objects. And of course, um, we also have to remember that for the Telsabi Abiyad figurines, I was not able to actually go there and uh, look at them. Um, and uh, in all likelihood, um, very unfortunately, uh, they are no longer um, there uh, because of the war that has uh, troubled the region for so long now. But so these are you know, some of the things that I could uh, make statements on um, regarding production. And then I also looked um, at use wear. Um, which comes in the form of you know, intentionally damaging these objects, handling polish, polish, and there are some other interesting markings as well that can tell us maybe a bit about the social settings in which they were used. So some of them have impressions of fabric or matting, um, impressions of string and the like. And finally, I looked at where we find these objects after they've been discarded or deposited. So are they um, placed in buildings or open areas? You know, there's a whole range of different context types that we can find. Uh, are they primary or secondary? So um, are they intentionally placed somewhere, for example, in a bin or in a platform, or are they seemingly just discarded um, in secondary refuse contexts? And of course, uh, also very important spatial patterning per level. Uh, as you can see, <clears throat> uh, heat exposure um, are mentioned is mentioned both on their production and use because it's quite difficult actually to ascertain when in um, a figurine's life it was um, exposed to heat. At times, I think it could be related to production. They, they were never baked as ceramics, but maybe um, there was a certain color that people wanted to attain uh, because some of them are very strikingly red uh, because they were exposed to heat. Maybe that was uh, you know, a desired um, outcome for the people making and using them. So I, I want to give you just um, a few examples of you know, interesting finds that I did because I incorporate uh, time into the analysis. You know, often um, we are sort of um, annoyed by the fact that we don't have any patterns in our data. But of course, if you remember that um, I, you know, even though I, I have a very large data set, um, especially you know, in uh, figuring studies, but if you spread those numbers out over uh, uh, roughly two millennia of occupation, those numbers are not very high at all. So it's not surprising then that there are also not very clear patterns to be found. But if you actually break it down into different um, levels um, 
or phases, depending on, of course, the resolution of your C14 dates, you can actually start to see some patterns that are interesting and, um, and meaningful. And for example, um, at Telsabi Abiyad, um, we can see that um, you know, zoomorphic figurines actually decline substantially, and they come mostly actually from the earlier tells, Telsabi Abiyad uh, 2 and 3, uh, most notably Telsabi Abiyad 3. What we can also see is that if you look at the context um, uh, of ash deposits and pit fills over the entire um, course of these 2000 years, it doesn't really constitute a very high number. But if you look at Atelsib Abiyat 3, actually almost all figurines are found in pit fills and ashy and burnt contexts, which is uh, very interesting and something that completely disappears in later levels. And indeed, there is an extreme clustering of figurines that completely disappears. Um, but that we see uh, at Telsibi Abia 3. Um, this is just um, a small um, sample of an assembly, um, assemblage found in one pit uh, that consisted of at least 106 figurine fragments, which is really um, staggering. And there are two other pits that also yielded um, a couple of dozen of figurines each. Um, all with a burnt uh, and ashy fill. And um, the original excavators also noted that one of these uh, fills was actually burnt in situ with, with these figurines um, in them. So that's very, um, very interesting and something that is very tempor temporally restricted. <clears throat> um, an example from uh, Chata Hug, um, concerning um, the intentional damage done uh, to uh, zoomorphic figurines um, specifically here. Um, again, it's, it's um, you know, something that we see throughout the levels um, in very low numbers compared uh, you know, to the complete assemblage of, of figurines, but actually we, we do see an increase. And we can also note uh, by taking into account um, spatial analysis that um, we find much, uh, we find many more of these figurines um, in the north area on the eastern mound. And there is an increase in the later levels um, of, you know, breaking and uh, deforming or flattening uh, these objects. And this is, of course, something that you would not uh, notice if you just, you know, take this entire data set as just one cohesive whole instead of being spaced out over all these different different levels. Um, now I want to turn uh, to the importance of understanding social settings. Now we, we have similar practices at uh, you know, different Neolithic sites, including uh, the damaging of zoomorphic figurines. Um, and also this sort of perceived focus on the head or better headlessness uh, in figurines sometimes linked to this sort of larger phenomena of um, the skull cult. So the actual um, manipulation and plastering of uh, human skulls. But I mean, it's very problematic to sort of um, see something similar and then um, say that it means or people were doing it because of similar reasons. And these two case study sites are a very good example. The picture above shows some uh, figurines from Chata Hug, uh, actually uh, made without a head. Um, 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 heads were removed uh, from number four and five. And then you see this whole range of objects that have dowel holes um, thought to be so that you could put different heads on objects uh, at different times. Now, from Telsabi Abiyad, we, we have um, headless figurines from the burnt village all from the same type, the, what I've called the decorated type because they have um, you know, so much um, elaboration on their bodies. Now these objects, if you look at the objects, they are not clearly visibly broken also because I you know I only have these drawings, but in this sort of curated um, assemblage that we have from these buildings, um, they were, uh, all of them were headless and not, not a single head was found. So there's good reason to believe that they were placed there um, without their heads to begin with. Now the previous research has interpreted these practices as being very different in nature. Uh, Lynn Meskel at Chateauhug emphasizes um, the importance of uh, figurines um, as objects with which you can sort of create a, a narrative. And she emphasizes that figurines are not static images, but they are changeable um, objects. 
Um, whilst for um, similar practices um, at, at Tel Sibi Abiyat, um, Mark Verhoeven has uh, very convincingly argued for figurines as sort of a um, social contract uh, between these permanent inhabitants of the site and these pastoralist people um, coming and going um, to sort of create um, a social contract between people by breaking off uh, the heads of figurines and maybe these heads were then giving a given to those uh, pastoralist um, people moving um, in the area around the cell. And also because um, as I've previously um, discussed these, these changes um, that affected um, virtually all aspects of life at both sides, can we um, see that in changing fig figurine practices? Well, there are uh, indeed some changes that we can observe um, at both sites. So it tells to be Abiyat, um, there's virtually no zoomorphic figurines um, in the levels dating to around um, 6,000 uh, 6, and later, um, perhaps due to the fact that, you know, herding occurs now much farther away from the site. People are not having daily interactions with, um, with, uh, with um, animals. And maybe that's why they stop um, representing them as much. There's also um, um, general decline in uh, figurine numbers and no more of this clustering in figure of, of figurines in these pits um, and ashy fields. So maybe, you know, um, in the earlier levels, there were people coming together in some sort of um, communal um, activities involving figurines. And maybe the, you know, we can see the burning um, of the level six settlement as sort of the culmination, because if you talk about, a, you know, a public spectacle setting uh, a light, this settlement was truly uh, a public a spectacle. But after this, uh, we have no more clustering of figurines and no more clear uh, contexts, uh, mostly just open area refuse context where we where we find figurines from here on out. Also, um, at Chateauhuyuk, we see differences. So for example, there's a large increase in the amount of horn fragments that we find. Now, um, thinking back, um, there are no more um, actual Aurog skulls being used. Um, and the, um, they were replaced by these sort of plaster skulls and uh, 3D elements and pottery. And maybe we can also see sort of these horn fragments as being proxies instead of you know, having the actual thing present um, at the site. There is also uh, an increased realism, um, again, albeit exaggerated, in anthropomorphic figurines um, that we don't see in the earlier levels where they are much uh, more um, abstract. Um, also, the, um, the removal of heads of anthropomorphic figurines, as well as dowel holes that we see are all found in these later levels. And maybe we can um, understand you know, this um, figurines becoming from maybe less anonymous to actual uh, individuals or maybe um, representing households or a lineage, lineages. And maybe they are used to negotiate these sort of, sort of new social uh, relations that are forming at the site. Um, and um, although very tentative, we would need more examples being excavated uh, of these final levels. Um, but there is um, some evidence that um, maybe anthropomorphic figurines <clears throat> are used to um, replace the actual burial uh, of people in houses. At least that's my interpretation. Um, and there is uh, there is one um, very striking example of this. That's building um, building 150, which dates to the <clears throat> excuse me, dates to the final period. And um, these examples all come from the same house, and they're quite um, spectacular, as you can see. Uh, one and two are made from clay. Uh, three, four, and five are stone examples. And um, number four and five are actually found um, placed inside of the same platform. So where we, <clears throat> in the past, had uh, people buried inside of platforms, now we find uh, you know, figurines uh, being buried in platforms. And again, this is only one example. So it's not really, it's sort of more, it's, yeah, it's something that maybe um, could be the case, but we need more 
more evidence, of course, before we can make any such claims. But it is a very interesting um, observation um, to make. So <clears throat> for my uh, concluding remarks, I think it's very important to realize that even with leg legacy data, if you really take a rigorous and systematic approach, <clears throat> you can still learn uh, a lot about figurines, about their production and use where. And this of course is very salient um, because we might have lost quite a few of these um, corpora um, that were housed in various institutions uh, in the Middle East, unfortunately. <clears throat> Furthermore, um, it's very important, I think, that figurines need to be studied um, as a complete assemblage and not focus on any particular type of figurine. And also we need to understand that figurines are not special material culture. They are part of a larger set of uh, material culture and they need to be studied um, as a whole. Um, there is sadly very you know, few detailed studies um, um, that take sort of this artifact approach, which um, has created large gaps in our, in our knowledge. Um, you know, if, we, if we know of more sites where, for example, um, zoomorphic figurines were being damaged on purpose or head removal, and, um, and the like, we could start thinking more about why do some sites have these practices? Why do others not? And you know, what are these sort of interaction spheres that we can see uh, through these uh, similarities and uh, differences in figuring practices? And of course, finally, as also uh, my, uh, the title of my talk implied, figurines are, as all material culture, socially embedded. And I think social settings uh, you know, are vitally important uh, to inform us about figurines instead of us using figurines to um, um, look at social um, settings. Social settings are a primary if we want to understand um, the why and how um, of figurine making uh, and using. And that was, that was it for me. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you. Well, the topic of the topic of this presentation is a very discrete corpus of ceramic donkey figurines that forms part of my wider ongoing PhD research on zoomorphic figurines from the Southern Levant. The project is still a work in progress and does not aim to offer a final solution or answer to the whys and wherefores of figurine life. Rather, the primary emphasis today is on the benefits of direct material engagement. That is, using artifacts as a primary springboard for research and understanding the technology, the character and the status of the material in hand, and how this might inform and impact this work. The overall spirit of the workshop leans towards a practical hands-on approach. So therefore, after the lecture and any questions and or comments from the audience, I have made a few replica donkeys for those who would like to have a look over there. And they're on the slide as well. And there is uh, there are complete specimens um, there as well. Sorry, they're complete ones as well as broken bits and pieces to illustrate what these battered fragments might look like on excavation. In addition, if you should feel tempted to make to try to make one of these, there's some clay over there as well. So please help yourself and have a go at creating your very own equid. For those who may be unfamiliar with some of the subjects at hand, I will start with a brief introduction to the archaeological background and then focus on tangible facts about donkeys and their figuring counterparts by outlining my methodology, that is the chaîne repertoire of figuring production, and some aspects of the use lives and dep deposition. I will conclude by sharing some thoughts on the challenges and perhaps considerations that may present themselves when studying figurative images. The when and where of donkey domestication is still under debate. A secure differentiation between the wild and the domestic donkeys on, and onagers is often difficult to ascertain, especially in the, larger, in the early stages of domestication. However, the criterion for identification become clearer over time as domestication and controlled breeding becomes more established. It has been suggested that this process occurred in two or more centers, probably in the early 
in the early fourth millennium BCE in Egypt and slightly later in the Middle East. In the Southern Levant, their presence in the region, wild or otherwise, is recorded during the late Calcolithic, and whilst their association with human society gradually becomes firmly established and intertwined from early Bronze Age one, that's about 3,300 BCE and onwards. The early Bronze Age begins with one of the most comprehensive transitions in the Southern Levant, exhibiting wide ranging changes in settlement patterns, land management, economy, and modes of social organization. Dispersed and loosely organized villages gradually coalesce into larger and more cohesive units that ultimately involved, evolved into walled urban agglomerations and fortified agricultural settlements. These settlement changes were closely associated with the colonization of new lands for the intensification of agriculture, horticulture, and animal husbandry, with an emphasis on the accumulation of staple goods and exchange of surplus commodities within local and regional markets. Cattle and equities become integral to this process through the power of the traction complex that initially featured the pannier and the plow. Later, ox or donkey drawn carts may have made their appearance as production and transportation of materials and commodities became essential in facilitating facilitating long and short distance trade. The literature is replete with descriptions, some more insightful than others. However, from my own experience with donkeys, there are few adjectives that spring to mind. They're sociable and curious, dependable, intelligent and thinking animals with a strong self, sense of self-preservation. Added to this, their physical attributes make them strong, hardworking, adaptable and all-terrain creatures with a robust constitution. Stubborn is an attribution that is often applied through misunderstanding. Aside from the familiar agricultural draft and load bearing chores, the versatile donkey is also employed in a variety of other related and little known tasks, including transportation of young animals and a guard donkey to protect other livestock from predators. These images are more recent, of course, however, there's no reason to presume that similar roles were not also relevant in the more distant past. In addition to this physical power-driven work life, donkeys also provide meat, bone, and skins. However, they are more commonly exploited for secondary products, such as milk, dung, possibly also hair, as well as live offspring. All these useful qualities and traits were undoubtedly also recognized, appreciated, and eagerly exploited by the earlier bronze Age communities, but also eventually gave rise to the diminutive images made of clay. Miniaturization, that is to say, three dimensional, freestanding, portable, and seemingly non utilitarian replicas of both people and animals have long been part of the human creativity. However, throughout the passage of time, the volume of such representations has waxed and waned mirroring the fluctuations in their significance to the societies that produced them. The Neolithic and Iron Ages produced a plethora of all types of figurines, while the Calcolithic and the Indian Intermediate Bronze Age were both fairly restrained in their repertoires. Figurines did persist, but in much lower numbers. Wedged in between these two latter periods is the early Bronze Age and its corpus of animal figurines. And I specify animals, as interestingly, this period is practically devoid of human images, with possibly only a handful discovered to date. Instead, clay animals are present throughout the period, representing a range of domesticates, namely sheep, goat, cattle, equids, that is donkeys in early years, and a few rare birds. Although largely understudied, they are, however, regularly discovered at archaeological sites throughout the region. Donkey figurines are unique amongst these, and they are central to the rest of the talk. Right, as I said, I specify animals as interestingly in this period, this period is practically devoid of human images, with possibly only a handful discovered to date. Instead, clay animals are present throughout the period, representing a range of domesticates, namely sheep, goats, cattle, equids, and a few rare birds. Although largely understudied, they are, however, regularly discovered at archaeological sites throughout the region. Donkey figurines are unique amongst these and are central to the rest of the talk. 
Much has already been suggested about the functions and the possible values and symbolism attributed to figurines in general, but little has been said about their concrete materiality and how understanding the details of clay figurines may eventually offer new insight into how and why they were used. To this end, my core methodology aims to understand the figurine chien repertoire, which is a process of figurine manufacture, detecting possible evidence for use, as well as integrating details of discard and deposition. As expressed by numerous scholars, such as Pierre Le Monnier, Roger Mori, and Peter Arco, there is no substitute to spending face-to-face -face time with your material. Following this advice, one of the primary criteria for inclusion within this research is the availability for first-hand study alongside experimental archaeology in the form of figurine replication. Both aspects have proven to be invaluable in the quest for, of beginning to learn how to read figurines. Rising to prominence, particularly towards the end of the 20th century, experimental archaeology is a useful investigative tool combining archaeological research and infor with informed experimental inquiry. This brings multiple benefits, providing an, Im an improved understanding of the mechanical and technical qualities, strengths and the weaknesses of the materials used, and also in the artifacts or principles that are under investigation. The associated experiential and sensory rewards includes insights into time investments, physical gestures and habitus, and environmental factors, to name but a few. So with no template for this particular category of material, my methodology has evolved and modified. I use various lenses, up to 8 to 10 magnification, recording visible technological details, decorative elements, breakage, modifications through wear and abrasive action, burning, and any other pre- and post-depositional activity. The study of ancient figurines and clay replication takes place in repeat cycles, each repetition informing the next, and so on. Learning by seeing and doing, gradually building a portfolio of knowledge and recognition. Visual records are created with photos, short videos, and if time, drawings. Adapting a multidisciplinary approach any available and associated data is also collected, excluding, including contextual information, formal reports, and evidence for social and regional subsistence strategies. The corpus, uh, by my count, there are 45 published and about 25 unpublished donkey figurines in the Southern Levant. Most of these can be found, while a small proportion may be a little harder to access due to geographical and logistical limitations. The 46 artifacts that I have seen to date are the main focus today. However, there are a couple of elusive and unique examples that merit a mention in order to illustrate details and differences in the overall corpus. It's a little different from Monique's corpus, isn't it? So now, how to recognize one of these creatures? The most familiar one is possibly this handsome creature from Atsur. However, Overwhelmingly, most of the others look like this. Using intact or near intact figurines as the baseline model, donkeys are depicted in a standing position with a frequently exaggerated tail. Uh, if exaggerated tail, slender neck and shoulders, upright ears placed on top of the elongated head, facial features may or may not be present alongside a pair of pots or panniers on either side of the body. A few examples carry a central load, such as here, the one from uh, Tel and Hesse, or a rider, which is a unique example from Kirvet Zerakun in Jordan, one I have not accessed at all. And some later figurines display fragments of harnessing and saddlery. And the one on the top left is unique, and there are not many of those without any um, load, but it is definitely a donkey. Familiarity with the complete figurine helps to identify the broken ones. Damage to legs and tails is ubiquitous. However, donkeys display elliptical or oval scars from absent scars, absent ears, and scars on the torso from former loads or a rider. Detached elements, panniers or pots, ears, and bits of saddlery are also considered rep representations of the host or parent donkey. So how are these figurines made? A few scholars have offered up 
suggestions, but most commonly that they were made from a single piece of clay. My research to date has led me to believe that the figurines are generally not made from a single piece of clay. Rather, they are the result of modular production. And this, this is, that is prepared elements that are added to the central core, the torso, permitting an easier and more controlled result. Now the sequence of production was no doubt individual to each figurine maker. So here's a short video to illustrate my take on this process. Can you do it? I can't see it. Oh, I can see it. Oh, it's going. Oh, fine. Fair enough. So there I am um, pinching out a leg, one leg. You can do two, two more, but if you pinch too many, you won't have much of the torso left. So you, you can add one, one leg, two legs or four legs, but usually I end up adding three legs or four even. And this has been edited because it would take me about 15 minutes. So there's four legs and then I'm smoothing the body and ergonomically the way you smooth things, you end up with an anchor like that and one end. And then the head is added by uh, making a hole in the head. It's usually lozenge shaped or elongated. And then it's placed over the anchor and then smoothed back into place. And then the eyes and mouth and sometimes the nostrils are added uh, where appropriate um, or if desired. The panniers are possibly attached uh, when they're leather hard because otherwise they're really quite squishy and pliable. And um, they are attached and secured with a long strip of clay binding the vessel to the body of the figurine. And that creates a strong, smooth seal. And the ears and um, preformed ears and the tail are then added and smoothed into place. And when that's completed, you can come, you leave it to dry a little bit because you can't keep smoothing it. Otherwise you shift all the clay around too much. And when it's leather hard, you can smooth it again using water. And if it's really, um, really quite leather hard, you, you can use a stone, a stick, a shell, a fingernail to burnish it if you so wish. And when it's bone dry, you paint it. And the final firing, which none of mine are, however, that can um, that would happen after a period of time when it's totally dry and it's likely to have happened alongside pottery. <coughs> so back to the archaeology. Having studied the figurines individually and with reference to the fine context, I then review the donkey Ghibli in a, as a chronological group, much like pottery reading. Here's an example from Bétiera, a work in progress, so a bit relaxed and untidy, where they are arranged along two axes by a local excavation area, which, all of which would obviously be slightly different, and through the early Bronze Age periods uh, up and down. This helps to detect any trends in styles, shapes, any local clusterings, and this reading is repeated for all the major donkey figurine producing sites in the region. The sum of all of this is a broad regional overview where there appears to be two more or less distinct groups, early donkey figurines found in funerary contexts and later figurines that are not. So in the early on Bronze Age one, figurines from this period are dated according to the associated pottery and other grave goods. There are four early Bronze Age figurines that are found in rock cut burial chambers that I know of. And these figurines are um, the best preserved examples that we have by far. I've only seen three of these, but uh, hopefully you'll see the fourth. I have a tiny intact EB1 um, the fig donkey figurine was recently found at a burial at Mishmar Ha'emek as well. And lastly, those, though still unseen, there is a unique donkey up on the top right uh, from tomb D12 in Jericho. And it is low tree, but has a dish-shaped flattened back. 
This is a reconstruction with an added mini vessel for possible offerings as hypothesized by a number of scholars. Stylistically, the majority of these are very well made and have sustained minimal damage, if any at all. If present, containers or pots that they carry are relatively large and rounded. Now, EV2, the figurines are a little more frequent by now and are fairly solid and robust. Carried containers are present and there's occasional decorative addition of red paint, either in random stripes or as approximate harnessing. In sharp contrast to the EB1B group, breakage is common and no complete specimens are known. Finds contexts are regularly irregular and include both domestic and public spaces, in streets and alleyways, in houses, courtyards, however, most frequently in destruction layers, in ash piles and communal pits, cast aside with other mixed household refuse. The EB3 donkeys are the most numerous by far, with more size variation and displaying greater attention to stylistic details. The frequent addition of colored paint or fine strips of clay depicting possible harnessing and salary, whilst decorative straps are often visible along either side of the back and around the tail. The presence of the central scar mid-back may be suggestive of an alternative load placement or as a rider, as in this one from Tell and Hesse up on the top left, and the earlier image that we saw from Kirbet Zerokun. The bilateral vessels persist although the containers become smaller and more closed, as you can see on the top right there. Furthermore, as EB2, these vessels are cast aside in any old context and usually in these destruction pits and uh, ash piles. And they are in very poor physical shape, broken in any number of ways, chipped, fractured, divided, and worn. In summary, this brief periodic overview reveals that there's a clear temporal uh, evolution, numerically and stylistically. It confirms the, con the consistent presence and evolution of figurines, indicating continuity of social significance, although without revealing any clear hints regarding details of this function and value so far. With EB3 Jericho as the exception, the data suggests a shift in emphasis from burials from, burials from EB1B and onwards. Although new decorative elements are often added and at the same time, the incidence of fragmentation and other damage increases. In addition, there's also change in depositional habits. On the surface, it, it appears somewhat contradictory. Why spend extra time creating and embellishing an artifact that is then seemingly abused and then unceremoniously discarded? What changed? The impasse suggests and firms the need for further layers of investigation. These circumstances are difficult to explain based on material figurine evidence plus context alone. So before becoming too immersed in comparing the spatial distribution of figurines and drawing on other strands of associated evidence, it would seem equally important to zoom out and look beyond the essential character, beyond to the essential character of each site in question. There may, for example, all be early Bronze Age sites, but what kind of site are they? What was their function? What might that mean as regards the presence or not of donkey figurines? The early Bronze Age exposure of Tel Megiddo is dominated by an EB1B palace and cultic complex. Tel Begirach was a multi-purpose urban center. Tel Yamut, an impressive EB3 palatial economic center, while Tel Al Hesse was predominantly an EB3 agro-commercial hub and a later industrial bone carving workshop. These major sites have been excavated to high standards and over many seasons. However, Tel Bidjarach, Yarmouth, and Tel Al Hesse all boast high numbers of figurines. Tel Megiddo, on the other hand, has yielded less than a handful. Although the physical status of the figurines appears to be uniform at all of these sites, that is variously damaged, the even distribution of donkey figurines may be a reflection of the nature and function of each site in correlation with the archaeological periods represented. Perhaps understanding this relationship may provide clues regarding their significance. Detailed familiarity with the corpus in conjunction with experimental aspects has afforded me a greater confidence in reading figurines and appreciating any modifications when they occur. In addition, it facilitates a 
the recognition of natural versus unnatural, the expected as opposed to the unexpected. Are the breaks, are these breaks or detachments where one would expect them? Is this a natural break or has it been subtly modified hereafter? Moreover, the challenges of researching a, a non-utilitarian fragmented artifact that may have been published to varying degrees of clarity has been offset by the option of replication. Recre recreating, manipulating and experiencing a complete figurine, even an informed and perhaps slightly composite one offers an alternative view that can be stimulating and provide food for thought in a number of ways. To my mind, this creative process is comparable with the conservator or pottery restorer's magic of reconstructing a pottery vessel from a pile of shirts. In conclusion, the intention of sharing this selected excerpt from a larger work at hand was to illustrate the importance and opportunities of the bottom-up artifact-driven approach in different ways of detecting the one-slip nuances inherent in the current physical position of the donkey figurines. It is anticipated and hoped that this narrative will eventually serve as an echo revealing aspects of the long-standing relationship that bound the early Bronze Age communities with their equine livestock and gave rise to, to the creation of the donkey figurines. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So you can take questions from the yeah. physical audience and yeah. the questions from the less physical audience. Yeah. So any anyone has any questions in this slightly presentation? Yes. Uh, nice to see you again. Well, the donkeys come a lot late, the horses come a lot later. So in this period, there are only donkeys, possibly towards, depending on where you are, maybe down south, right down way south towards the Negev, there are horses a little earlier, in, but that's not till the EB3. So this in the earlier periods, and certainly up north, it's donkey figurines. But I mean, like you say, there are some of them that I look at that are late EB3, and I'm wondering what is their intention? Is it a donkey? Is it a horse? Maybe because both these creatures can travel. But um, so we haven't gotten around to to uh, high enough resolution to be able to tell. But so far, I believe in the EB3, they're mainly donkeys, and the EB as a whole. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, it has been suggested that especially the ones that were in EB and one um, EB one B uh, that they might have had some residue analysis, but I don't know. We there are only four known in secure context from from uh, from uh, burials, but it's a good point because they are much bigger and then they shrink down. So whether something changed, and anyway, it's not, it's not a burial context later on. So there was a different, there was a change in function, a change in, in use life for them. I suppose when it's not clean and polished, you know, by then, in my mind, Find you know, fingerprints of children, anybody who or is really high professional, it seems to be personal. Something that we suggest is the presence. Well, I I can't say I don't think they are children. Um, simply, the most of the fingerprints I see are quite large. But I'm not a fingerprint specialist. There are those who've written excellent papers on recognizing these things. But my feeling is that it isn't necessarily a, a children's thing at all. Um, and the violence has meted out to them it seems very unchildlike. I think. But anyway, um, there is no way of telling the. Um, you know, who would have made them. But there are lots of marks on them in terms of fingernails and, and imprints of textiles or matting, different things like that can be noted because they're not all super smooth. If you look at them with a microscope, there's a lot of details to be seen. Thanks, Shirley. Yeah, actually, um, I just sort of wondering, something so, 
So it seems like both of you were saying that the that there's that they become more fragmented as time goes on, that there are the bigger fragmentation and that the people I think what you said was it started they started out mostly in groups, but they were there by other contexts. And that made me wonder about the use of the breakage. And you just said you don't think that it's kids, but boy, watching kids play is boys. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't imagine that you know, you would so it made me wonder if they're coming from educational context. And maybe even if they're not even designed as boys, kids are playing with them, so that explains some of the damage that we see. And then they get lost up in the garbage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I have done some experiments on breakage, and the, that's what I was saying about reading the figurine and reading the breakage. I've done a lot of experiments, not on donkeys, because they're broken differently, but other animals. And to break a figurine, you need to offer it a lot of violence. When they're fired, it's really, really hard. And some of the breaks are really clean, 90 degree breaks, and that is not anything you can do. I have experimented had strong young men and women try and snap them and it can't <clears throat> can't be done in a fired one. So um, I, I, I just find that very hard to follow that toy story line. Sorry, but if I can just follow up. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood, but my understanding was that generally they're not intentionally fired. They may be sunrise to a certain degree, but I, I didn't get that sense. No, mine are all fired. Mine are all fired, but Monique may have something to say because hers are generally not fired as in pottery kiln fired. Is that right, Monique? Yeah, that's right. Um, oh, one minute, I can't hear. Can you hear? Hello, everyone. Welcome to All Happy Landing. Try again. Try again, Monique. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, okay. carry on. Uh, no, um, there is um, quite often heat exposure, but not in any controlled manner. Some of them um, are hypothesized to sort of have this sort of indirect heat exposure by being close to uh, ovens or hearths, but some of them are very clearly burnt, um, but not in a kiln, but just a play, uh, put in an open fire or the like. But um, if you want to see um, intentional breakage in my figurines, you usually have to see some sort of mark uh, at Chateau Huc, uh, the clay was still relatively plastic, and we can see that they were gouging and pulling off elements. At Tassabi Abiyat, they were at least hardened to some degree. <clears throat> and it was actually because um, of uh, our talks that I started um, sort of uh, focusing on these sort of very clean uh, cuts through the necks. And I, I do have a few, but because there are no clear marks, in my case, it's harder to substantiate um, intentionality because they are so fragile. Um, um, so um, it's more difficult in the Neolithic, I would say, to um, substantiate claims about intentional uh, breaking of these figurines. Yeah. Can I, can I just follow, just yeah, I follow up and say that um, when I talk about kids breaking things, I'm not thinking of a kid going like that. I've, I've seen kids use lots of different ways of breaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so, so yeah, you know, I'm just saying. But I'm if you know. cross it, <laughs> yeah, but Jody, if you, <laughs> but uh, cr crushing, crushing figurines with the stone, I've tried a whole plethora of tools of destruction on my replicas, clearly. <laughs> and the, the breaks that you get if you use a stone, for example, is a crush. And we don't see that kind of crush. And I've tried different clays and different temper, um, and it does give a different signature altogether uh, than the ones that we see. Um, so, um, so how do you see the And I think there's lots of different ways. Some of them, this is what I learned from my reading. Some of them are detached pieces. The, the legs that you add, that they pop off. The ears, they pop off. So they don't really count. They're just extremity breaks. And of course, the sticky out bits like legs they can come off uh, quite easily, um, both because of attachment and because they, they, they're prominent. Um, but I just think they get thrown around and broken. I mean, if I go into detail of, of not only the donkeys, but also the, the other animals, they are made and they were lovely. And then somehow they are damaged and broken. And then they seem to be picked up and used for other things, possibly as a tool. 
and then they're just dumped in the in in in, in the rubbish. Sometimes they end up in the fire, where I can see that the broken surface surface has a scorch mark. So it means that they they seem to travel from being beautifully made to really becoming far less important and having different levels of of importance and agency uh, as their life progresses and it ends up in in the ash pile. Yeah. Take some questions from the Zoom chat. Uh, Norma Franklin in the chat. And she says, uh, perhaps okay. a little off topic, when do you see the change from an abundance of donkey figurines to horse figurines? Or do donkey figurines continue because we are looking at an animal who was a beast of burden? I have to say, Norma, it's a little bit beyond the EB and the area that I have, um, I, I'm dealing with at the moment. So I think, um, as I was saying earlier, I think it's more to stick with the donkeys and then the horse figurines come a lot later. And I think people are also, there's a lot of talk about the inter, interbreeding between uh, horses and donkeys, which was a very valued animal, the mule, which uh, also came to prominence. But I'm afraid it's not really part of my uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know because um, there are very few and to do invasive uh, um, studies on them is clearly not very popular with any of the museum groups or anyone else, which is totally understandable. But some of them you can see, I mean, their local clays are used and we compare, compare them with the pottery. And there seems to be a correlation between what was locally made. I don't get the feeling that people were seeking a special clay for a donkey. They might have traveled depending on what their remit was, whether they with the owner and ended up somewhere far away. But I think they're locally made with the clay that's there at hand. Um, and so therefore they mirror the pottery on the whole. But um, studies have not been done on, on how far they travel. That's hard to get permission to do. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Uh, Thanks to everyone uh, in Zoom land who joined us, and of course, the local people as well. Uh, here we go. However, we will, um, we will open a uh, cell phone Zoom uh, for those of you who want to stick around in Zoom and take a look at some of Nadia's figurines that she's made herself and watch the audience tinker with them. And uh, Jody will be the first to try to break. <laughs> So otherwise, uh, thanks for coming and uh, you'll be able to see the Zoom link uh, that Aaron is posting now. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Monique. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. thanks, Monique. It was great to have you. You're welcome to stay and watch as well. <laughs> <laughs>